Hey, Chris. Hello. Hey, Ross. How you doing? Good. Yourself? I'm great. Uh, I, I hear I'm you're a little haze. dressed down today. <laughs> How did you know? You can't see me. I, 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 I'm looking down. at you through the camera. I can I can see into your see into your clothes. I, that's kind of creepy sounding. Let me let me take that back. I can see your clothes. <laughs> I, I'm I'm here in ChrisHayes.org World Headquarters. Uh, I was in my apartment <laughs> and uh, about to go to Austin this evening uh, for Netroots Nation. So I'm. Uh, I'm, uh, haven't, haven't, haven't made it in the office and haven't haven't quite put on a dress shirt. So hopefully, uh, hopefully the folks watching at home uh, won't won't take me less seriously. I think I think you'll connect with them actually better than I in my business casual collared shirt will. <laughs> um, so anyway, I'm you know I, I'm Ross Douthat. I'm uh, with the Atlantic, um, and Chris is the Washington editor of the Nation. All right, good. Um, so those, that's, that's who we are, and we're going to talk today um, about uh, American politics. And I thought we'd start off by talking about the absolute most important pressing problem <laughs> facing America today, which is uh, the cover of The New Yorker this week. Yeah. How about it? <laughs> well, for anyone for anyone out there out there watching who hasn't seen the cover of the New Yorker, unfortunately, since it's a rival magazine to the Atlantic, I don't have a copy in my office. But it depicts uh, Barack Obama in full Muslim regalia, um, giving in in the Oval Office, giving a fist bump to his wife Michelle, who's dressed as some kind of Symbionese Liberation Army. Uh, radical from the 1970s, complete with machine gun and afro. Um, there's an American flag burning in the fireplace nearby, and a picture of Osama bin Laden on the wall. Did I did I forget anything, Chris? I think I think that's it. I think I think Symbionese Liberation Army is 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 charitable. I think Black Panther. Uh, You're right. No, I, I was Black I was Panther going for a sort of you know I mean it it, it is a post a race neutral descriptor, campaign, but so. in some ways yes she has right, an no, afro. It is she's is. right she's a she's a she's a Black Panther. Um, right. Yeah. So anyway, and so what did you think? What what did you think of it? I mean, obviously, so what happened was there was a, quite a bit of consternation and, and outrage. Um, your your colleague. Mark Ambinder uh, at the Atlantic uh, said that there's a, a kind of politics of outrage which has gotten out of control. It's affected the body politic, and this was the perfect example of it. David Remnick, the editor of the New Yorker, was paraded around. Um, uh, you know, the, the, the cable shows to defend it. It, it. it got the requisite amount of attention. My editor, Katrina Vandenhoevel, at the um, at the Nation magazine, um, wrote a piece on our website, sort of defending defending the cover, or defending the sort of um, imperative of provocation for, for magazines and magazine covers um, and and but and the, and the campaign it should be noted uh, called it d- they called it offensive I believe was the word they used uh, Obama himself didn't respond to it uh, except somewhat um, I would say casually and, and, and curtly on Larry King Live was the first time he's actually talked about it but their press office did put out a statement calling it offensive and I think that stoked probably the fires of of, of of, of the amount of uh, ink that's been spilled. Yeah, it would have it would have been interesting to see what kind of reaction it would have gotten if the Obama campaign had laughed it off. But on the other hand, I can I can see why they didn't. I mean, it's it is a strange thing because um, you know clearly the intent of the cover is to um, you know satirize um, right wing paranoid fantasies about Barack Obama. And frankly, paranoid fantasies that that aren't just right wing. I think. Um, one of the interesting things about uh, the whole Obama is a Muslim, Obama hates America, Obama's lying um, about his past meme is that, you know, of, of course it's present on, on, on the far right, but it also, you know, it circulated heavily during the Democratic primaries among Democratic voters. The first time I ever saw any of those uh, mass emails about Barack Obama being a Muslim, you know, they were emails that were sent to my liberal Jewish friends that were sort of right. you know, Jewish American chain emails. And it's this weird, you know, it's this sort of intersection of right wing fantasy, American folk culture, paranoia, and, and so on. But, but anyway, so the New Yorker covers sending it up. Um, but it's sending it up in such a way that you know, it's it's a picture of Obama as a, right. as, a, as, a, right. as a Muslim. I mean, it's not. And uh, I was actually this, and this may may be an insight that's appeared somewhere else. Um, so if it if it has credit where credit is due, but I was at. A, at I don't a, have I don't have any original insights. I'll just say that. As a, well, as I, as no, a this, and this isn't original <laughs> to me. This was this was raised at a, at a dinner party I was at last night. But I'm not sure if the person there had got it from somewhere else or if it was their own. But they said, "Here's the problem with the with the cartoon." is that what political cartoons 
99 out of 100 times or 95 out of 100 times, they satirize the person depicted in them. So yes. if you look back at, you know, like uh, right. Thomas That's from exactly from right. Thomas Nast all the way down to Pat Oliphant and and, yep. and and so on, you know, the 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 iconic images, you know, the sort of um, Herblock's images of Nixon and so on, they're always images that are meant to, you know, portray in an unflattering light the person who is the subject of the cartoon. And right. the New Yorker cartoon is sending up someone who doesn't appear in the cartoon. It's sort of, it's saying, here's this image. This image exists, it, this image doesn't exist in the cartoonist's mind. It doesn't exist in the mind of the New Yorker reader. It, you know, it isn't actually what the cartoonist thinks about Barack Obama on any level. It's supposed to be what a hypothetical, um, you know, far-right crazy or, you know, paranoid American Jew or what have you thinks about Barack Obama. And I think that that... I thought that was a really smart point. I think that that's sort of at the root of a lot of the controversy about the cartoon, why it sort of isn't, you know, why people haven't taken it in exactly the spirit yeah. in which clearly it was drawn. I think, that's, I think that's an excellent point, actually. And that actually, I think that captures exactly what's startling about the image is that your frame of reference for, for cartoons is exactly that, as a send-up of the subjects. Um, and I think, you know, I... I'm sort of of two minds. I mean, I guess I think that the, 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 the reaction has been over and done, but I, I do think it didn't work. And uh, uh, the other reason I think it didn't work, which which uh, what my new favorite blogger, Todd Nahazy Coates, uh, pointed out, um, if you're not he's, reading He's Todd a good blogger, Coates, isn't he? he? He's fantastic. I mean, he's, a, he's just a wonderful writer, generally. Um, and... Uh, I should he, put in the plug for the big piece he wrote on Bill Cosby. In, in, which in, was in fantastic. Atlanta. And I'll put in a I'll put in a plug for his review of um, Shelby Steele's book about Barack Obama, which was in the in the in the back pages of the Nation. But but he um, he made the point, you know, I guess Remnick at one point sort of compared what they were doing in the cover to what Colbert does, and he made the point, right. which I've also seen other places, which is that the image on the cover, you know, from to my eyes is manifestly absurd, but not quite absurd enough insofar as. Colbert is this absolutely, obviously histrionic caricature, exaggeration um, of the <laughs> of of kind of the the, the figure of the the right wing blowhard. Right. Um, and the the image actually is just at a certain level an image of what some people actually think. Um, and and what they think is, to my mind, manifestly absurd. Um, and but. But it somehow doesn't quite go far enough in a weird way. You know what I mean? That it like it, it doesn't it doesn't push to the boundaries far enough that it signals its own um, caricatureness clearly enough. And that and that I think and that I think is a, a, both a political yeah. critique in terms of the the offense that it's caused or the or the problems that it might engender for for the for the campaign or the or, or in furthering misconceptions which are pretty um, ignominious and vile. But also as a kind of aesthetic critique of it not really working as a as a cartoon, ha ha. I do think I will say that what I did find funny about the cartoon and what I do think it tried to do in an interesting way is that what, the thing that's really hilarious to me about this what I call I call the chain. I wrote a long cover story about chain emails that focused a lot on the, the Barack. Yeah, no, it was a great piece. And and one of thank you. And one of the things that I that. And I call it folk media. And, and, and one of the things that I find fascinating about them is, is how sort of internally inconsistent the, 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 the rumors is, right? The rumors are. So right. he's both a Muslim, but then he's also part of this radical black church. So how does that work? And then his, his, his wife is a, is a black panther. And so none of it, like he's a Marxist and also a, a, a radical Islamist and also a passive. I mean, so – there's, there's, it's like the the con, the misconceptions and the rumors and the kind of dark um, suggestions about Barack Obama are all like internally conflicting in a way that the cartoon I thought put together in a sort of funny way. Um, so I did. I, I will credit it for, for for getting at that, which I think. No, is I mean I thought it was a really in, in, interesting. Yeah, I mean I, I thought it was a really interesting idea interesting maybe the wrong word but but I could I could certainly see what the cartoonist was trying to do right, and right. and yeah I mean it is a it is a funny image in in certain respects um, you know if I were 
you, you know, all of these debates sort of boil down to the, you know, does it help Obama, does it hurt Obama metric. If I were a New Yorker editor wanting to run a provocative cover that also, you know, didn't hurt Barack Obama, not that this should be the motivation of the editor of sure, New Yorker, right, and I right, hope it isn't, right. but, you know, running that cover after Obama wins the election Right. I, I, I think the, the cover would have been yeah, interpreted very differently it if it had would come out hilarious. like you know a week before yes. inauguration day. It might have been <laughs> hilarious. Yeah, actually, it would have. You just saying that actually, it is hilarious when timed that way. That, yeah, that, that's a really good point. It's actually a really really funny image in that context. But in this it's right, like, but in this context, right. it's sort of. It, I mean, it's. You know, it is, it's thought-provoking, which is a good thing in, in a cover, I guess. It does sort of, you know, provoke thoughts about... Yeah, but right. they're thoughts people were already having about right. the extent to which these rumors will factor into the campaign. I mean, it's, it's interesting because Daniel Larison, my favorite paleoconservative um, far-right blogger, has been on a tear about, about, this, about this cover, but sort of more generally about um, what he sees as sort of efforts to help, well-meaning efforts to help Obama by liberal pundits and so on. I'm not sure if this cartoon falls into the category or not, um, but sort of efforts to help him that actually hurt him. Um, mm-hmm. And, he, you know, he's always talking about, uh, Larison always talks about Roger Cohen, um, the the Times International Herald Tribune columnist, who's yeah. always writing these columns about how Barack Obama is just so cosmopolitan. He's such an yeah. international <laughs> figure. He's such a world <laughs> man. And Larison's like, yeah, like, this is why up. he might lose the election. Yeah, right. Yeah. And you can yeah, see no, the New Yorker. That's very true. That, yeah. That's a really good point. And 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 it, you know, the, I mean, Barack Obama obviously, the, probably you know, ninety percent of blogging heads airspace has been taken up with discussions of Barack Obama one way or the other for the, for the past. Well, like, I, yeah, but, I don't think that's I don't think that's unreasonable. But no, it's, he's endlessly look the, the phenomenon of Barack Obama, if not you know the person itself himself is you know is endlessly fascinating. And one of the fascinating things. Is exactly this this sort of issue of, of um, you know what makes him distinct and unique in many ways aside from his tremendous formidable political talent and I think um, let's say you know very very sharp mind and, and he's a, he's a phenomenal writer which I actually think is one of the one of the kind of underappreciated parts of his appeal um, is is that he has this tremendously uh, sui generis story um, right. and it's a story of. Uh, you know, it is a really cosmopolitan story, and it's a fascinating story. And, and, it, and I think the the spine of the narrative has has has, a, has been the initial thing that it's attracted a, a considerable amount of attention. And it's also this double edged sword, I think, as as uh, as Larison points out, and as as the cover kind of illustrates, because all the rumors around him, um, you know, center around the fact that at the end of the day, you don't know where he comes from, right? right. Um, that he is. Unrooted from and and you had a you know you had a very interesting uh, conversation with Bill Moyers uh, recently, and w- in which I think he, he asked you to define conservatism, and and you had this very interesting response about essentially a defense of American exceptionalism, kind of broadly construed, the distinctness of what makes America America through these sort of uh, distinctly American traditions, and I think that's part of what is um, you know it's it's part of what is scary about Barack Obama. Um, right, for, I mean, it's not, but it is, of course, as you said, it's also part of his enormous appeal, because in a sense, yes, exactly. he no, is right. That's right. American right. exceptionalism. He is, yes, you know, he is. don't he totally have a Barack right. Obama yeah. running for president of France or Germany or, you know, no. prime minister or what, what have yeah. you. Um, <laughs> yeah, that's not going to happen in France. <laughs> right. <laughs> um, <laughs> So yeah, no, and I, you know, but so, but no, but no, I and I, I completely agree. There is there is this sense, and I think you know, I think conservative pundits, including ones who I really respect, have have taken that and taken it a little bit over the top. I think Peggy Noonan, I, I may be misremembering this, but I think she wrote a column about, you know, sort of just not exactly that feeling, not knowing of the the extent to which you know Barack Obama has sort of. You know, walk the walk of you know of, of living in America, and and yeah, I mean, I th- and I think that that's overstated. Obviously, like you know, Hyde Park is as much America as you that's know right. suburban Ohio or or where. Thank you for saying that. Thank no, you well, well listen, now it's a big it's a big concession, and it'll come back to haunt me. <laughs> I, I know. <laughs> no, but, but, but yeah, I so mean, but there is a sense in which he has you know his his story is so is so exceptional that it's it's meant that he's sort of moved in. You know, he's he spent his life moving in, you know, sort of through milieu that, you know, that are different from the milieu that certainly the most presidential um, 
candidates, uh, you know, e- even though all of our presidential candidates have tended to come out of this sort of elite, uh, you know, Al Gore, George Bush, John Kerry, all came out of elite schools and came out of the elite in a certain in a certain respect. Barack Obama really is the first figure to emerge out of this sort of, you know, multicultural sort of somewhat yeah. pan national. Um, yeah engine of elite formation in a way that, you know, I mean, Al Gore went to Harvard, you know, is, an, is part of the American elite, but, you know, he's the son of a, of a Tennessee senator with roots in right. Tennessee going back generations and so on. And right. Barack Obama has roots in America going back generations, but he also has roots in, in, in Kenya and, you know, and in right. Indonesia. And, and these are, you know, I think, I think these are very, they're, they're very unusual, unusual things. Um, any, but that's, I, I don't really have a point there. It's just sort of an no, obvious but it, factor and I think in the, that, you know, to, so, so to, to, to kind of pivot off of that, to, you know, sure. part of, I mean, part of the reason that, that I think we got so much, treated to so much speculation and, and discussion of the cover is that it's sort of a fallow period right now in the, in the, in the, uh, in the, in the campaign. I think a lot of people in the press and in a lot of places are, are undergoing a primary withdrawal. I know I am. No, I just wrote a, a, a yeah. blog post about this. I, I, I find, I, I mean, we were spoiled. We hadn't had a primary campaign like that in so long. But, um, but it was so great to have have actual votes being cast right. every right. week. Yes, exactly. So every right. scandal, every like sort of media created firestorm that came along was click, quickly subjected to what should be the ultimate test of a democracy, which is okay. Do do the voters care about? This right. did they care that Hillary right. cried in New Hampshire? Did they care about right. Jeremiah Wright? And that just right. doesn't exist in the general election. That's right. That's a really good point. And I, and it and it doesn't. And one of the things I think, um, one of the lessons that I think the the Obama pe- campaign learned fairly well um, is is to kind of is to keep your cool, right? To not overreact to you know to to kind of. Um, News cycle firestorms because they're going to burn themselves out. Even even in the even in the primary in which, in you know the primary season in which you did have these votes very often. Right. I mean, but in the six in the you know the six weeks between, um, I'm trying to think what the last. I guess the six weeks between te- was it Texas and yeah, Texas, Texas and Ohio, Ohio and, and, yeah. and Pennsylvania. You know, there were like seven or eight stories in there. You know that, that were like the news of the moment. And I think the Obama campaign has kind of learn to, you know, to, to, to basically steer through. I, I actually think the McCain campaign has done a pretty good job of this as well. I think at this point, they're, they both kind of, um, wh- wh- while they both have these kind of rapid reaction forces they've deployed, and that's just part of kind of winning the daily news cycle, I think that, that there's a pretty good understanding um, among both campaigns and in the press right now that what's happening right now is not of tremendous import in terms of, you know, who's going to get elected in November. Would, would you agree with that? Well, I think there is, but at the same time, I mean, there is this, you know, there there is this press machine that just exists yes. to to sort of feed on these sort of these mini scandals, whether it's you know what Wes That's Clark right. says or what Phil right. Graham says about you know That's about right. the American economy, and right. and I mean, I you know, I think out of among sort of young blogger wannabe pundit whatevers, I tend to be a little more sympathetic to this mentality than than some people. I mean, I think I think the sort of the the freak show quality has been an object of hate, especially from liberal bloggers yes. for a long time. And I was sort of I was sort of inclined to defend it, especially during the primary campaign. I thought you know at least I thought some of the issues that you know people were saying were non issues like Jeremiah Wright and so on actually did kind of matter and were worth talking mm-hmm. about. But mm-hmm. that being said, it's, you know, I, I think the sort of the length of the general election campaign and the absence of regular reality checks in the form of, you know, primaries or caucuses or what have you, I, it does throw into relief the extent, you know, just the sort of utter, the utter triviality. And then the way that in, in that blog post I wrote, I quoted something by uh, Chuck Todd and someone else at first read sort of saying, wow, what a crazy week this was with all these crazy things going on and it's no wonder neither candidate can get any traction with all this crazy news and so on. And you're like, but, you know, the news isn't really crazy. It's only crazy because the press decides <laughs> to cover it that way. Yeah, and, you know, I, I have, I would say I'm sympathetic in the sense that I think there are structural underpinnings for the Tribunalia insofar as there's a lot of, I mean, 
there's a lot of, of, of hours to fill on cable news, right. and there's a lot of column inches to fill. And I, I was talking to young to 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 a conference of young journalists last week, and I said, imagine if you went in for a job interview and had to talk about yourself for eight hours, right? Like. You would start saying some really stupid stuff. <laughs> you, I mean, or you would start talking about things that aren't that important, or you would say things you really regretted. I mean, and in some ways, that's the dynamic that covers the entire campaign, both in terms of the candidates themselves, the surrogates, and the press, right? Is that everybody, it's like a gun has been put to everyone's head, and everyone has to keep talking all the time. Well, there was a great, the a, great a great example of this was the whole controversy, actually, and Chris Beam just did a piece about this at Slate, I don't know if you saw it, about, to go back to Obama and, and his supposed Muslim ties, the, the Hezbollah fist bump, you know, yes. that there was, so there was, so, you know, Barack Obama gives his wife a fist bump, and um, then some, you know, there, somebody's talking about it, and some commenter on a Cal Thomas column at townhall.com <laughs> says, oh, it's a Hezbollah fist bump. And then Chris Beam, who's, you know, writing for Slate, sees this, you know, is reading quickly, sees this thing and thinks that the column itself has made this claim. And so then he says, oh, conservatives are saying it's a Hezbollah fist bump. And then Fox News, you know, <laughs> decides they need to do a thing about this controversy. And so the, the, the anchor woman says, you know, is it this, this or a Hezbollah fist bump? Um, fist but, but in terrorist, terrorist fist, fist jab. jab, right. But in fact, nobody except one, you know, it, there, there was no <laughs> actual conservative groundswell of people saying it was Hezbo Fist Bump. It was literally one commenter <laughs> a in a comment somewhere. thread. But it was just everybody needed to, yeah, they, it was like, oh, this is interesting. Uh, you know, we need, we'll write something about it for Slate. We'll do something about it on Fox right. News. And, and yeah, and out of, yeah, out no, of control that it is, goes. That is, that's a perfect example. And I... You know, one of the hardest things to do during the primary, and one of the things that I'm, I've been grateful for in, in the end of the primary, one of the hardest things to do was um, was to not write about the campaign, was to, to w was to speak with one silence. You know, I mean, uh, you know, <laughs> you know, you, there there would be these firestorms, right? And I would think to myself, well, this is idiotic. I want to. I want to weigh in or correct the record, and then I would say to myself, "Well, if I weigh in, I'm just, I am literally just giving oxygen to this. I'm just, you know, and even if people, you know, if I write something or people find it persuasive or they don't find it persuasive or they, you know, they link to it on their blog, then they're just, you know, now we're talking more about this thing that I think we shouldn't be talking about. And so, right. you know, what what I tr what you would try to do, what I would try to do is I would sit it out and I'd say, well, I'm not, you know, I'm just I'm going to sort of resolutely." Uh, not write about this, but it it's essentially becomes a collective action problem because you can't, uh, one person cannot, you know, single handedly, you know, no one's sitting there being like, oh, you know, Chris Hayes has not written about this. So I, I really think we should drop this, right? So it doesn't, it doesn't make any difference if you, if you don't write about it. You, 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 you underestimate, you underestimate your own there, influence. There are many things that I have chosen not to write about <laughs> just because you also have chosen not to write about them. And so there's That's a right, snowball effect. Their, there are RSS feeds. No, so that, you know, and that, so I actually have been happy to kind of follow the race um, a, a, as it's been unfolding. And, you know, I get the emails in my inbox. Although, you know, if, if anyone from the McCain campaign is watching Blogging Heads, I would love to be on your email list, which I've requested like 10 times. <laughs> no one has put me on. Um, you know, I, I get that. Because you're, you're a pinko socialist, and frankly, yeah, you don't know, deserve know, you know, John I'm, McCain's I'm, emails. I'm, I'm a working journalist, you know, the oldest uh, continuously published magazine in, 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 in weekly in America. So Yeah, so, so, was, so no, was John Reed, a working journalist. So was Walter <laughs> Durante, a working journalist. Yeah, uh-huh. Yeah, uh-huh. So, I, you know, and I, I do think the one story, though, to, to come back to what I do think is a really important story, and it, it, it's a uh, there's two sides to the story that's happening right now is it are, are, are organizational stories, not right. the media message stories. I think that the amount of resources the Obama campaign is deploying to states is totally unprecedented. And I'm saying this is someone who has organized before, whose brother is an organizer uh, for the Obama campaign and who's, who has spent a lot of time, a lot of fr friends with field organizers. What the Obama campaign is doing, organizing grassroots st wise, is just in a different category than anything that's been done before. Now, will it bear fruit? That remains to be seen. But what they're doing in terms of resources, staff, and all that is unprecedented. And part of the reason they can do that is because they are projecting they're going to raise a ton of money. And they have raised a ton of money in the primary. And a question mark has arisen the last few weeks, which is, are they actually going to raise that money? Which I actually think a lot of people are overly complacent about. Um, 
I think that the conditions of the primary, which made it so special, like you said, the fact that there was always right. uh, an election coming up, enabled them to raise tremendous amounts of money because money is raised in, in cauldrons of urgency. And there was, a, there was a constant rolling boil for three months. And you could always plausibly say to your donors, we need money right now because Texas votes tomorrow, Pennsylvania votes in two weeks, you know, Rhode Island, you know, American Samoa, wherever, wherever the, the primary was happening. And that's no longer there. And I think there's, a, there's kind of a general kind of lull in, in, in not just, you know, the press corps and I think people's attention to the race, but also in, in the donors. Yeah, well, and especially, I mean, I think that this may point to sort of the big weakness of the Obama fundraising model, the sort of the, the hugely successful small donor model that seemed and, you know, and did revolutionize um, campaign fundraising in, in, in a lot of ways. Um, it, yeah, it may just be that for times when there isn't that kind of cauldron, um, the old-fashioned method, the methods that McCain is more likely to use, the right. sort of, you know, going to rich bundlers and getting them right. to, you know, sort of reach out to their friends and, and get larger, you know, larger sums of money, bundle them together and so on, that that just works better than the sort of mass appeal um, that, that Obama has, has more or less relied on, which is, you know, frankly, um, you know, I, I mean, you and I have been having this, this back and forth over at um, TPM Cafe where we're doing a a book club about my and Raihan's book, which I guess I should hold Grand up. Grand new party. Grand new party, uh, 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 holding yeah, it, hold up, it up, plugging it, and yeah. so on. <laughs> um, but, you know, and one of, one of the things I, I've said there, as I've said before, is that, you know, as someone who's interested in, in reforming the Republican Party um, from within, I found the Obama model, and to a lesser extent the Ron Paul model, and also even the Mike Huckabee model of, to, in, in very limited ways, um, of, of fund, fundraising very encouraging, because it suggested that you know, there there was you know one of totally. uh, one of the barriers Absolutely. to structural reform in in both parties is yes. you know the, the you know the the influence of of uh, big money donors um, over the party, whether they're individuals, corporations, etc. And you know the the idea that well, there are sort of two ideas. Idea number one is the idea that you know a candidate can be less reliant on you know sort of money money interest period and more reliant on actual voters. The second thing, and I thought that this was a great advantage for Obama, is it j just the amount of time that, it, yeah. that this kind of fundraising frees up, that internet fundraising frees up for, you know, I mean, the, the amount of time that, um, you know, John McCain had to spend raising money after his primary campaign was over, that he could have been spending, you know, actually campaigning, um, and, and but, it, but this is true also of governance as well, the amount of time that you know, candidates right now have, or not candidates, but politicians have to spend sort of shoring up their fundraising while in office. To the extent that internet fundraising, mass donor fundraising could diminish that, I think, you know, it'd be good for both parties. It'd be good for democracy. It'd be good for all of us, you know, crazy, wonky people who think, you know, oh, yeah. we should talk, we should have, talk about policy and so on. Um, but, but then, the, you know, I, I think the, the limits of Obama's fundraising seemingly over the last month are, are a real reality check for that kind of yeah. that kind of impulse. I don't know. What do you think? Yeah, that, no, that's, I, think, I think it's a question of, you know, there, 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 there's sort of two ways you can view this. One is a somewhat sui generis phenomenon. The other is a, a new model. Um, I, I think the jury's out. I, I tend to think it's a new model just because I think there's a lot of um, – there's a lot of trends in political economy and technology that, that have come together to facilitate, you know, gr uh, broad small donor support um, that lowers the barriers to entry and has made, you know, this sort of kind of small donor democracy a much more viable model. But it, it's, it's also easy to overstate. And I think the numbers, just the sheer amounts of money, I mean, what was he bringing? There was one month where he raised something like fifty million dollars. Right. Like I mean that, that and that is that is clearly just, specific to you know, Barack that's Obama. That's bonkers. I mean that's right. that's crazy. That is a crazy amount of money. And I think that I think I got caught up in this too, thinking, well, we got you know we got six you know five months, fifty million dollars a month. Right. Well, hell, it's the general sixty dollars. You know, he'll raise. You know, he's going to raise half a billion dollars. And you know, I I, I think that that that's probably not. Have, have they still not cycle. released fundraising numbers for June? By the way, is that right? They still right. Haven't? So there's no, there's no. I don't think. No, I think they're. I, you know, they haven't released June fundraising numbers. I think you know eventually they're going to have to file their quarterly, um, which they must have just filed. The quarter just came out, so those will have to come out at some point. Um, 
That's funny, actually, because I think the other the, 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 those 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 quarterly filings um, happened uh, very recently. So that sh- those numbers should be out, and we'll actually be, be able to sort of see um, what what it looks like and, and compute average donations and see if there's right. been a swing. T- I, I, I would predict a swing towards large donors and some of the the, the Clinton donors um, who presumably they're trying to court, but. But yeah, it's a real, and I, you know, I, we're definitely on the same page in terms of the virtues of this kind of small donor enterprise in terms of what it does vis-a-vis the policies. I mean, you know, the point that I was making in uh, the, the, the response that I posted on, on TPM Cafe was about, you know, the fact that there, these, you know, donors have these, they create these structural impediments to reform. And, and on the Democratic Party side, one of the big things that I wrestle with is is the, the degree to which the party is really um, funded in large part by Wall Street and finance. Um, right. and, and you see that uh, reflected in all kinds of, you know, policies they take. They can't, you know, there's certain things that, that, are, that are kind of outside um, the range of the possible for the Democratic Party uh, due to the fact that they just get a lot of money from hedge funders and uh, investment bankers and, and, and the finance industry. So to the degree that th- those things can be detached, um, that's, I think, to the good for everyone. And I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm optimistic about the, the long-term prospects for that, but I think a little more realistic about what, what we're actually going to see this cycle. Um, and I, I generally think, actually, and this is something else that, that relates to this sort of sense of you know, primary withdrawal and also um, the, the, the diminished fundraising, I actually think there's a little bit of complacency right now on the part of the left and Democrats about an Obama victory. Um, I, you know, if I had to bet money, I would bet Barack Obama is going to be the next president of the United States. But I think it's going to be harder fought and closer than I think some people are allowing themselves to believe right now. And I have to say that worries me a little bit as someone yeah, who, you know. I, I mean, I, I'm sort of, I've been in the camp that assumes an Obama victory um, for for a while now. And nothing, I guess nothing I've seen since the whole Jeremiah Wright scandal first broke has has changed that view. I think before before Jeremiah Wright, before that whole shift in right. um, the media narrative about Obama and sort of the public perceptions of of his past, I thought Obama was on his way to a landslide. Um, right. At yeah. this point, yeah. I think the landslide. I, I I think he now just has a ceiling. Um, right. Yes. And I and right. and I think that that re- is is reflected right now in the polls that we see right now where. You know, he didn't get a huge bounce after he got the nomination. Um, he, you know, increased increased his lead marginally. He's doing very well, seemingly on state by state polls, but but national polls, you know, he he can't break. He's consistently ahead of McCain, but he doesn't seem to be able to break more than say four points ahead of him. Um, and, and, and so, yeah, yeah. and well, and so my expectation, and, and this relates to my thesis of a boring general election cycle campaign, is that. Actually, they're, they're, the way the two candidates are positioned, there there's there is no room for the kind of wild swings in polling numbers that you yeah. often see over the course of these races. Because you know Obama has enormous advantages, um, probably financial, certainly just structural opinions of the Republican Party, the way the economy is going, and so on, that will prevent him. You know, he's never going to drop below forty five, forty six percent of the polls, right. yeah. but. Right. You know, because he's uh, considered to be, a, you know, a crypto Muslim, and because he has right, sort of right. the tie, and and because you know he's a black candidate running in a country right. where there's still a chunk of people who would vote Democratic in other elections who will vote Republican in this election, and we don't know what percentage of the electorate that is, but there is a percentage right. that will just not vote right. for him because he's a black man. Because right. of all that, he he has a he has a seal. so he's gonna he's stuck in the forty five to I'd say to fifty three percent range. And McCain yeah. McCain's ceiling, I think, in this election is fifty one percent. Like there's just no way that oh he yeah wins. I mean I, yeah if he wins it's gonna be a real squeaker. I mean that 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 I completely agree with. Um, it's interesting though because there are you know there are conservatives um, and uh, you know Jim Pinkerton who's on blogging heads a lot has said this but in at this dinner I was at with other conservatives somebody somebody had a state dinner riding on McCain having a 40 state landslide um, and, and I think there is you know I, I I think that that in a in a different political context I think that's totally imaginable precisely because of you know the sort of the, the fact that Barack Obama is such a sui generis and therefore potentially yeah. troubling figure. I think in right. in a different year at a different time, you know, John McCain, the war hero, maverick, 
Republican uh, patriot and so on could win 40 states. But sure. This I mean, I think, I, you know, I think, year, I, you know. I think Al Gore or John Kerry w- w- could, would win, you know, 52, 50. I mean, I think they would win yeah. pretty handily this year. Um, I think. I think John Edwards would probably win pretty handily. I mean, I think in some ways one, one of the things that – one of the most fascinating dynamics of of the, the transition from the primary to the general, you know, there's been a lot of discussion about the kind of ideological, um, you know, the ideological shift and, 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 and Obama reversing his position on, on FISA um, and then some other things which I think are less substantive and more rhetorical. But I actually think – and I, I think that's that's – that's true and accurate, if, if somewhat overblown. Um, but I, I think that the, one of the most interesting shifts is from from the Obama campaign's perspective, right? They Hillary Clinton was the generic Democrat in the primary, and so they had to be the special and different Democrat, right? right? So they had to emphasize difference. That was what their whole primary project was, and they did a very good job. They did it successfully. Now they have to do exactly the opposite, which right. is minimize difference. The point is that Barack Obama is is underperforming a generic Democrat at this point. And so what they need to do is, what they're trying to do, I think consciously, is take Barack Obama and make him a generic Democrat, which right. to people that kind of fell for the different Barack Obama is, like, really difficult to watch happen because there's a sense in which, A, I think Democrats that have watched, you know, watched the, the Kerry campaign com- unfold and, and the Gore campaign before that – there's a sense of like, oh, here we go again, making these same mistakes, sort of tacking, tacking towards the middle, broadly construed, etc. Right. Um, right. This is Ar- Arianna Huffington went on her whole rant about about tacking towards the middle and so on. Yeah. But you know, in, in, and I, and I'm not saying this. I think it's important in these discussions to separate politics from substance. I think he's wrong substantively because I think he's was really deeply, deeply wrong on the FISA vote as as a matter of principle, as a matter of law, and as a matter of legislation. But I'm I'm not. I'm also not convinced that the politics of it were bad. Um, you know, I, I think I think they were, but but I think I'm a little clouded by what my actual policy preferences are. But I, I also right. think that from their perspective, it's entirely rational to essentially sand off his edges and try to and try to make him as essentially generic and undifferent as possible because that's basically the hurdle they face. I mean, what you basically want is people to walk in the voting booth and say, you know, change or more of the same. This this kind of I know the Democratic Party, and they don't seem as bad as as the Republicans do right now, and I'm going to vote for that guy, um, right. and not think I'm going to vote for this this special, unique, once in a lifetime, um, you know, chance at you know, national uh, his, history making and uh, right. expiation of the nation's racial sins and, and right. whatever whatever other you know very deep intense kind of rationales there are for people's very strong feelings towards the Obama candidacy. It's funny because as a conservative, it's pers- that you know that's that's the only thing that I that I could see myself making me vote for Barack Obama. Right. No, <laughs> but I mean, but you know, right. I'm not I'm that's not right. the person that they're that they're. That they're targeting, well, obviously, and, and, course, and rightly, and course, rightly so. I mean, I think right. that would and, be a and, big mistake. And for, and for the conservatives that do have supported Barack Obama or flirted with or been appealed, they've been what's appealed to them is precisely that, right? Is that like he doesn't seem like just another Democrat, right? He does seem distinct, um, right? I mean, I think well, I think that the conservatives have, you know, some of the sanding off, some of the moving to the center. I do think conservatives also find appealing. I mean, and, and you right, can sure. look at like you know Eli Lake just wrote. I haven't actually read it yet, but wrote a big piece yeah. in the New Republic this issue, arguing that you know actually Obama will be more of a, ne- a neocon basically than than confident think. imperial management, right? <laughs> Confident imperial management. So, um, so, so there, there, there is some of that. Um, but, but yeah, I mean, for, from my own point of view, I'm less enamored of that. Just partially because I, I just think, and this is, is a question that I'll, I'll put to you. I, you know, I just have a hard time, um, and I think for good reason, fi- just figuring out who, who Obama is on sort of policy and ideology and substance. Um, and I'm, I'm. V- have no confidence in my ability anymore to sort of read him the way like Eli Lake yeah. tries to read him in the New Republic and the way various people, liberal and conservative alike, have tried to read him. I mean, I think more and more, um, I, I did a blog post where I said that he was sort of opaque, um, and I mentioned yeah. like previous sort of opaque presidents like Dwight Eisenhower and so on, um, yeah. who were who very successful. But I think that that was actually wrong. It's, he's not opaque. I mean, he's, he's actually more like Bill Clinton in the sense that he's 
except without presumably all the hor- awful personal baggage, but in that he's a right. politician who, who who just seems, you know, he's just a really good politician, which means he's really good at, you know, making you think, um, yeah. making you think that he agrees with you. Um, That's right. And, <laughs> That's, and, you know, you read Ryan yeah. Liz's piece in the New Yorker this week that everybody's yeah. in the issue with the cover that everyone's talking about, and it is, yeah, it's a portrait of an incredibly ambitious politician. And, and in a sense, that makes me feel... But- not so bad about an Obama right, presidency right. because as a conservative, you know, I mean, as liberal presidents go, I thought, you know, I found a lot of things to like about the Clinton presidency and, you know, it, I, I'd certainly rather have that kind of ambition-driven pragmatist in, in office than someone who will go off wildly half-cocked and, and, and so on. But but so my, but I, you know, but it means I don't know, you know, and so, you know, what, what is Barack Obama's first hundred days, for instance? Like, right. what do you, what's, what's, what are your thoughts? You know, I, I feel I, I agree at, at one level, and then I disagree at another. The level that I agree on is that I believe that you know ideologically, I think he's in the center of the Democratic Party, and it's a Democratic Party that's moved to the left over the last eight years. So right. after having moved more... to the right dramatically from where that's right. I mean, I think the Democrat, even having moved to the left, I think the Democratic Party is still way to the right of where it was, say, in in 1984, for instance. Oh, sure. I mean, you know, I I don't think a guaranteed minimum income, which which Richard Nixon proposes, you know, and and the Democrats defeated because they thought it was too stingy, is going to be... Um, right. Going to be going to be on our going to be in the platform uh, th- this year. But no, I, you know, and I think in some ways I think that's somewhat inevitable in the sense that I think that the 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 standard bearer of the party, the presidential nominee, is, is generally going to represent essentially where the middle of the party is. Um, and I also think that you know David Brooks I thought wrote a pretty smart column when he sort of talked about the two Barack Obamas and he basically said Republicans are idiots and they're going to get rolled if they think this guy is some sort of like you know. Right. Ally Stevenson, goo goo, like touch. No, like, yeah, he's a politician. He, I mean, no one becomes, no one accomplishes what this guy's accomplished without being very ambitious, very driven, very savvy, very practical, etc. So, um, I agree with all that. I actually think the, he, the the policy priorities are incredibly clear in the first hundred days, and the reason I think that it has little to do with Barack Obama and more to do with the fact that if you Venn diagram out all the different parts of the Democratic coalition, there's essentially agreement on three things. Withdrawal from Iraq, initiating withdrawal from Iraq, universal health care of some, you know, through some mechanism, and uh, a new carbon regime through some mechanism, most likely cap and trade. Ba- you can basically get everyone in the the sort of you, you, that those three things pretty much capture the entire Democratic coalition, I think, in terms of if, if you were to overlap priorities, right? There's a Except lot of other Except for Joe Lieberman, like, but, but, you know, I'm kidding. Yeah. Yes, right. Yeah, Except, yeah, yeah. You know, and there's, obviously, there's outliers, but I think everything from, you know, um, working class folks, uh, African American, Latino, um, people that are li- living in, in cities and in the South um, and in the West, um, upper middle class uh, pr- professionals, creative class types, you know, those Everyone's, you know, when move on, when when move on, you know, a few years ago, did their poll of sort of like trying to put together a positive agenda. It was those three things, and then like, uh, you know, civil liberties and, you know, restoring the constitution, which I think probably won't be a priority, frankly. Um, but I do think that there is tremendous internal consensus in in the center left coalition on those three things right now. Now, the details of that obviously are going to be very sticky. I mean, those are three massive right. projects, and the things that I tend to say to people when I talk about a Barack Obama presidency, and particularly about whatever compromises he's made, um, is I say, look, if he does all three three of those things, you know, he's a great president. <laughs> I think um, from from where I stand, if he does. Two of those three things, he's, I think, a good president, and, or, or, or that's, 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 you know, that's, those are sizable and significant. If he does not initiate withdrawal from Iraq, and I want to sort of pronounce this as clearly as possible, he will destroy the Democratic Party and his ability to govern. That that's, is, I mean, that's a strong statement because I think, well, I mean, I guess it depends, as always, on what your definition of initiate withdrawal is because I think under some definitions John McCain is going to, you know, initiate withdrawal from Iraq, you know, when, uh, after after he takes office. If by initiate withdrawal you mean reduce American troop levels and sort of put us on some kind of a path that could lead to eventual withdrawal. But, right. but that isn't what you mean, right? I mean, No, I mean, I mean implementing some kind of, you know, strategic plan for withdrawal for 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 16 16 months to two years and we're out 
Yes, you know, whatever. Yeah. I mean, people use the word timeline. I, I actually think that, I think what people, you know, Henry Kissinger, you know, had this thing that he said to Nixon about peanuts, the salty peanuts about withdrawals, you know, that that it's like you can't just have one. Once once you start having them, you want more and more. Um, you know, I think that there'll, there'll be a logic of withdrawal that'll that'll seep in. It'll, I, I, from my perspective, because I, you know, again, let's separate the politics. I think substantively, morally, you know, politically, righteously, we need to withdraw from Iraq and no longer occupy the country. Obviously, there are people that disagree with me, but politically, I also think that that, that end result, which I think is a substantively optimal one, is is is, is going to be politically feasible, you know, is going to have a, a kind of inertial force um, of its own once withdrawal starts, the same way that staying has had a kind of inertial force um, by by the fact that we just haven't withdrawn soldiers, in fact, we've increased them. So I think that, and I think that the, as a as a sheer political statement of the nature of, of the of the kind of sentiment of the of the the base of the Democratic Party and and center left coalition, failure to just to see less troops, you know, in month in July than in June and less in August than in July. Failure to see that kind of diminution right. is is going to cause absolute chaos inside the coalition. That's that. Uh, that's my prediction. That's I mean, that's that's a strong prediction because I think there's a very good chance that I mean I think I think I think with both presidents with both the president McCain and the president Obama you will see initial diminutions of of troops. They will be strong, right. larger diminutions in an Obama administration than a McCain administration. But both um, in both cases you will see them. Um, I think that there will though be you know a, a sort of inflection point of some kind six months to a year in. I, I'm not sure when, and obviously it'll depend on events on the ground in Iraq, but where we will either sort of, you know, then stabilize troop levels and it'll be clear that we're sort of staying with 80,000 troops for the next few years, right. or, you know, or the or the, the beat will go on and, and withdrawal will go on and it'll be clear we're actually getting out. And I think, you know, that's, that's my suspicion is that at that point Obama will choose to stay with 80,000 troops because I think that I think that that will be the consensus of frankly the the DC foreign policy establishment which I, I imagine you don't have wild amounts of respect for but which I'm shaking my I'm shaking my fists you're shaking your fist but I but, but but I think and you know maybe I'm wrong but I think that no I don't think I don't think I don't think you're wrong Obama's it's nature a, as a you know as a deeply political no, as opposed right. to ideological figure and you know he he will not want to be the president who has you know the Washington Post editorial page editorializing every day about how he's going to be responsible for whatever um, you know catastrophe falls in Iraq from us pulling out and and yeah I mean frankly is, you know well go, yeah go ahead sorry no I, I agree that there's going to basically there's going to be they're going to weigh this in sort of cost benefits both you know in terms of the policy and the politics and that's part of the reason that you know from my 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 small sliver of the of the platform, you know, to the Obama people, say you will just you will destroy your ability to govern. <laughs> yeah. You know, there will be revolt. I mean, people feel incredibly strongly about this war and have felt it for a long time, and you know, have watched it unfold in a way that is just um, deeply saddening and angering and frustrating for all sorts of reasons, mostly largely and primarily the, just the raw human cost of it all. And uh, they also feel that the party has essentially very cynically decided the war is their best friend politically because as long as it goes on, they have a, they have a, a sort of a way to bludgeon the Republicans. And there's a lot of people who feel that this is a morally bankrupt decision. Now, I, I don't necessarily endorse this theory in its most cynical uh, strain, yeah. but there, there, there's something to it, and I think that, you know, people really care about the war in a deep, genuine way in that they want the war to end. They think it's terrible. And, you know, there's going to be some breaking point, I guess is what I'm saying. And I, you refer to it as an inflection point, and I think that I think he can re forestall the breaking point as long as that diminution, you know, begins. Right. Um, and he and he can buy himself time, but if the diminution does not begin, and in some ways, there's a certain amount that has to begin just because of the nature of troop rotations and the fact the right. army is literally going to you know implode unless you know we we get some. I mean, literally, you have machines that you know are designed to stay in the field for 12 months, and you know you do it for. Well, and the negotiations and, with the Iraqi government are going to turn out in you know in 
I mean, the, the Iraqi government is going to ha need, for domestic political reasons, to be able to right. claim that you know they are that's on right. path exactly. to, so right. to such a real that's sovereignty right. and so right. on. Uh, yeah, again, no matter who that's is right. president. Um, so I mean, I guess you know my my only point would be I just think you know I, I think there has been a lot of cynicism in Democratic Party's approach to the Iraq War. Um, I think, and frankly, I, I, it'll, it'll be interesting to see too what happens if and when the debate shifts to Afghanistan. I think there's been some cynicism on the Democrats' part with respect to Afghanistan too, making claims about um, you know wanting to move troops to Afghanistan primarily as a way to bludgeon Republicans in the Bush administration. That you know, I, I I'll be cur I'll be curious. Let's put it that way to see, you know, what what the Democratic Party's attitude towards the war in Afghanistan is as our presence in Iraq diminishes. But that being yeah. said, I mean, I also think you know the Democratic Democratic leadership is, you know, and, and you know, I say this as someone who is a lukewarm supporter of the surge. I mean, I think you know people are responding precisely because the Iraq War has had such you know an immense human cost, uh, both to to our own troops and to Iraqis. I think. You know, pe people had had the surge been a manifest failure. Um, I don't think that the leadership of the Democratic Party would have said, you know, okay, um, this the war is our best friend. Therefore, we will, you know, continue to right. um, sort of tacitly support the Bush administration's policies. I think there would have been enormous pressure of the kind I presume you'd like to see to get out of Iraq. But precisely because, precisely because, you know, human suffering in Iraq has seemed to diminish, has not seemed, has diminished. Markedly, and obviously there are many overlapping reasons for why this is the case. But over the that's past right. year and a half, you know, I mean, I mean, I think that that's you know that's part of the bind that the Democratic leadership finds yep. itself in, and that's part of the bind that Obama will find himself in. That you know, you do at this point. I mean, you know, I, I do think we, you know, think we have have a moral obligation to withdraw from Iraq in a manner that you know minimizes the. You know, given how much suffering we've already created, sure. minimizes the amount of suffering, and I, I think that you know there are important debates to be had about you know what 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 that means, and I think, right. yeah, I, I guess that's no, yeah, no, I I agree. I just think that the signal has to be sent early about what the I mean, and, and you know, Obama laid this out in his speech, so I think that he's that you know the, the recent speech he gave on Iraq, which is that. My point is that from the political perspective, this you know I agree that the mechanics of how a withdrawal happened have to be obviously considered it's the, the mechanics of that are complete I wouldn't even pretend to have expertise on on that um, but but from the sort of policy perspective and strategic perspective about what the end point is right I mean the end point right now for the Bush administration is a really long-term presence and that's the end point I think for the for, for a, a proposed McCain administration I mean what what's been going on with the status of forces agreement that's in, right. the, in, in the midst of being negotiated that's going to replace what is currently a UN UN mandate you know we want to we want to be there for a long time, and we want to be there. And we, by we, I mean the United States government as currently represented. We want to be there for you know a few very, very obvious reasons. We want to make sure that the oil doesn't fall into the quote wrong hands, and we want to have a strategic presence in the Middle East. And I think yeah, sure, there 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 are humanitarian concerns, and I'm not going to say that those are. I don't think those are just window dressing; they're real. But that's yeah, I mean, not I think it, they depend. You know, I, I suspect that some people in the Bush administration care more about the humanitarian that's concerns right. yes, than other exactly. people. But that's right. You know, yes. I think that's so, true in any in but, any White House. Yeah. So, on that on, on that note, I you know on, on, on my on my warning about breaking breaking the, the Democratic Party or. Um, I think maybe we should we should give the kind folks watching a you know allow them to go back to work if they're eating lunch at their their lunch yeah break. no no we've 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 covered a lot of ground well it's been great um, it's been great talking to you Chris and next time yeah. we'll, we'll come back and we'll and we'll talk about you know the breaking of the Republican Party another time so <laughs> sounds, I guess sounds it, good it's already broken we don't need to handle it um, <laughs> anyway uh, thanks again Chris you too cheers till next time talk to you soon. <laughs>